Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the weekend talks. We'll, we'll start with short med uh, meditation to prepare our minds and establish a pure motivation to engage in this weekend activity of discussing the Dharma. So then we should begin by just checking to make sure our, our physical posture is comfortable, our back straight, and then focus <coughs> our whole attention on the coming and going of the breath at the nostrils. Then trying to resist the temptation to drift off and think about other things. Really knowing the importance of having mindfulness and clear concentration on one topic and so that the topic or the object is the sensation of the air as it enters and leaves the nostrils with each breath. So holding our minds there, hopefully we'll be able to gain a degree of mental stillness and peace. And then within that we'll generate the motivation for engaging in this activity of discussing Dharma. So when you're ready, focus your entire attention on the coming and going of your breath. <clears throat>
Now think about a mirror, the reflecting surface of a mirror that is always there, very clear, very still, and it has the activity of taking the image of whatever colors and shapes appear in front of it. So our mind, like the reflecting surface of a mirror, is a continuum of awareness, clear and still, that has the capacity to take the aspect not only of visual objects, but of sounds, smells, tastes, and tangible objects, as well as thought activity, the objects that we think about from the past, present, and future. Whenever our mind is thinking about someone or something, there's an image of that object appearing in mind. So your mind is a continuum of awareness that goes from past to present to future. Let go of the breathing and focus your attention on your mind itself. This continuum of awareness. And try to experience its natural, underlying state of peace and stillness when there's no thought activity happening. Try to recognize the natural peace of your mind and abide in awareness of that. Now think that this natural peace and stillness of my mind rarely manifests. Throughout life, my mind is so often turbulent, not satisfied with what's happening, looking back into the past, pining for the good times, or looking to the future, hoping, planning for peace and happiness in the future. And in the present, we don't have time to be peaceful and quiet. We're just too busy looking after ourselves and others. So as we are all very similar, 
in having disturbed minds others feel the same emotions as myself the same ideals the same disappointments dissatisfactions and so on but the Buddhahood which is the potential we all possess is a state of total peace and happiness born out of universal compassion and wisdom so generate the thought I'm going to now engage in the activity of listening, thinking about and meditating upon Dharma in order to progress on my own path to Buddhahood so that by understanding and eliminating my own problems I will become a perfect guide to show others the way out of the same problems that they are suffering. So generate your whole mind in the aspect of bodhicitta founded upon renunciation and refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. then you can relax and stop the meditation. Now, the, the subject as you know, of this weekend, is reflecting upon the, the teachings that present impermanence, the ever-changing nature of things, and in a subtle manner, and in a gross manner, death, the, what occurs during death, so that we can cultivate in our mind constant awareness of the the brief life that we have the short opportunity to do something constructive with our minds and to overcome our tendency to think oh I can do it later when things get better I can then practice Dharma, I can then train my mind. Because there's no guarantee that things will get better or that we will live long enough to be able to find the right conducive situation to practice. As you know, the, the great Lama Atisha who was invited to Tibet bit over a thousand years ago when the teachings had begun to decline they'd been in existence in Tibet for many centuries but due to the degeneration of people's understanding of the meaning of the teachings and the activity of, uh, of rulers in different areas who were contrary against Dharma tried to eliminate the, the Buddhist study and practice, there was great danger that the Buddhism, in terms of a living,
practice would disappear from Tibet. So, with great difficulty, uh, Lama Ratisha was invited to come from India to Tibet. And he spent many years, 18 years or even longer, in Tibet, reviving the teachings. And he wrote a, a fundamental text condensing all of the Buddha's teachings called The Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment. Essentially, presenting the very essence of how to progress for each individual to progress from where they are or where they were through the levels of mental development to attainment of Buddhahood. And from that time, the teachings grew very strongly, not only the teachings, but the practice grew very strongly. Mainly, Atisha taught renunciation of attachment to this life and bodhicitta. But he also taught the whole spectrum of Buddha Dhamma. So first of all, from that story, we have to understand that Buddhism is a, presents a path for each individual to put into practice and train his or her mind on the path to enlightenment. Unlike many religions which are interpreted and sort of practiced as a social doctrine, you know, laws for society, this is how society must be, and you just belong to society. Buddhism doesn't have that history of uh, establishing a, a social regime or set of rules or laws for the people to follow. You know, for people to think, oh, this is the law, therefore I must follow it. Buddha appealed to people's reasoning because to mature spiritually to grow in compassion and wisdom cannot occur as a result of externally imposed laws or rules. The people can be made very compliant and follow the law but that is just in their external behaviour. It doesn't really change the external laws of the country don't really get hold of the problems in each individual's mind. And so we're always trying to work out ways to evade the law or trick the law and do what our mind wants us to do. It's true that you know most flourishing peaceful human societies have common laws of not killing, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, and so on. Because it is human nature to want to engage in those, in the various harmful activities for their own desires, to fulfill their own desires, for pleasure, for power, and their antagonisms and competitiveness against each other where we hurt each other in our selfish pursuit of what we want or what we don't want. So Buddhism, the point I'm stressing is a, is a path for each individual to follow. Following Lama Ratisha, the great Lama Sankapa, a few centuries later, Again, in Tibet, because of the natural degeneration of society and human beings, the meaning of the teachings was being lost and the individuals were not practicing. Others were using Buddhism in a, uh, a selfish method, means to exploit others for their own happiness, their own wealth, their own power and so on. So Lama Sankapa 
expanded the fundamental text of Lamaratisha, the Lamp for the Palm, in his various presentations of the graduated path to enlightenment, the Lamrim, in which he very clearly indicated that the pursuit of happiness in this life, the attempts to avoid suffering in this life, which dominate people's minds, do not achieve what we want, or if we achieve a semblance of the peace and happiness and freedom from suffering that we want, it doesn't last long. It's soon gone. And if there is no inner development of the mind on the path, then we live a life that ultimately is empty. When we die, we look back and all of the activity, all of the temporary pleasures and so on appear like last night's dream. I was fully engaged in life as it was happening. My emotions were up and down. And activity was happening just like last night's dream. But now I'm awake. That dream is meaningless. Similarly, if we live this living, waking dream of pursuit of temporary happiness in this life, and freedom from suffering, when we look back, there seems no point in the intensity of our emotions, our highs of happiness and our lows of misery and disappointment and depression and anxiety that occurred in the mind, just meaningless. And then facing death, entering the unknown, the great danger. So human activity just aim towards pleasure in this life and freedom from pain in this life. That is our motivation or purpose. That is use not only is it useless, but it's worse. In our confusion, we cr in, our, in our pursuit of pleasure and our avoidance of unhappiness, we create the cause for loss of pleasure or lack of pleasure in this and future lives and the cause of pain in this and future lives. But the very fact that we're human beings indicates that when we died in our past life, we died with an extremely virtuous mind, a very positive mind aware of a degree of reality, a mind that was not locked into me, my, what I want, what I don't want, but was open to others, a degree of compassion, a degree of love, which nurtured positive karma to be born human. We can't remember what happened when we died. We can't remember our past life, let alone the death. But the very fact that we are human beings is evidence that we came into this life on a wave of virtue, an incredibly powerful, strong state of mind which had taken many lifetimes, many lifetimes of renunciation, of working for others, of training our mind, to reach the point of creating karma to be born human and actually ripening that karma. But we're forgotten, we don't know. And so in this life we're born, it's said that when we're in the womb we did remember our past life and we remembered the causes which brought about our present situation to be a, a fetus in a human mother's womb. Unfortunately that memory fades after we're born 
and the immediacy of this life takes over and the baby simply forgets, the new child forgets. They can't even talk for another year or year and a half. So that's a long time with nothing to reinforce that those memories. Some children do. When they start talking, they're able to, to talk to their parents about past lives. But probably most of the cases, the parents say, don't, don't talk rubbish, don't get, eat your food and, and go out and play. And, and so soon they're discouraged and the memories go. And those memories are replaced by the instinctive self-centeredness. Every pleasure that we experience, which is the result of virtuous karma, wakens the seed of attachment in our minds. And so, forgetting our past knowledge, we grow attached to pleasure, and every displeasure, we have aversion and anger, aggression towards those who obstruct our pleasure or situations which are unpleasant. So our human life becomes preoccupied with just this life. In the graduated path to enlightenment in the Lum Room from Lama Ratisha and Lama Sankarpa, they, there is a teaching that even we may not cause great harm to others, we may not have great anger or harmfulness, but being attached and pursuing to the pleasures of this life and having aversion when we don't get those pleasures does not, is not the spiritual path. If we're fortunate, because we're born with a whole mixture of virtuous and non-virtuous seeds, you know, emotions, then life can be a mixture of pleasure and pain. But when we're only preoccupied with this life, we're going backwards. Our spiritual development, which brought us to be humans, has come to a halt. Not only has it come to a halt, but it starts to reverse and we go backwards, we fall downhill. Occasionally, people like yourselves, through past karma, you walk down the street, you might see the entrance to ABC Dharma Center, and you feel an instinctive attraction to the Buddha Dharma. It can be a, a book something, even not direct, a Dharma book, but something, Buddhism, or seeing a, a holy image of Buddha. And there is this innate attraction or interest is, is that the light is lit in your mind. And you meet qualified teachers, like the, the, so many great teachers have been here in this very place, who give further inspiration. And what they what happens is that the instinctive, the, the imprints of past connections with the Dharma, Dharma means you know, reality, are ripened in our minds. And it could come from other, other solar systems, other, other galaxies, where our mind may have been living, not necessarily in the Milky Way or the solar system of our sun. So, we learn that renunciation, as Lama Atisha, the main te things that he taught in Tibet, renunciation, giving up, attachment, clinging, grasping to the happiness of this life, giving up, aversion to things going wrong, and turning your minds beyond this life. That is the beginning of furthering 
our spiritual development. So we're not starting from scratch. As I said, the very fact that we're humans means that we are highly advanced. Actually, we're advanced on the spiritual path. But there's danger of regression. To go further, we have to let go belief, craving the real true happiness in this life and look beyond this life. So Lama Sankapa and Lama Ratisha, they, they said there are three scopes. The initial Dharma scope for improving your mind on the spiritual path is to look for happiness in future lives as being born as a human or as a divine being and to be free from rebirth as an animal, hungry ghost or a hell being. So to generate our mind in this attitude of looking beyond this life, that is the beginning of further spiritual growth. But of course, to be reborn, we, we already have that. <laughs> we are reborn as human. And what have we done in our human lives? We've regressed to self-centeredness, following attachment, aversion, pride, etc. So we don't want that to happen again. Because we were born with not only the seeds of virtue, karmic virtue, and mental virtue from past lives, but we also brought with us the seeds of karmic non-virtue and mental non-virtue from past lives. So, although it is a spiritual uh, motivation to have happiness in the future life, it's not enough. There's great danger that in that next life, I might be like this life, forgetting the causes to be born human and just becoming engaged in the pursuit of happiness in this life. We may not have the karma next life to walk along the street and see an image of Buddha, to meet a qualified Dharma teacher, to read a book which will light the flame of interest in Buddha Dharma. And we might follow the direction of so many others of regression, of going, reversing the spiritual path. So the second, so it is better to develop the thought beyond not happiness in the next life, but liberation, nirvana, complete freedom from the will of life, to completely eradicate those seeds of non-virtue and uh, karmic non-virtue and mental non-virtue to free our mind and in, this li in, the, in the next life achieve nirvana, liberation, then that is secure. And so Buddha taught the path to nirvana to so many. The majority of his followers entertained or developed that motivation. But when we look at it, it's good to achieve personal liberation, but still suffering, although our own suffering stops, suffering exists in the world. And for those who, whose spiritual development was at a point where they could recognize the reality of universal suffering, not just their own suffering, Buddha taught the development of the supreme motivation to practice Dharma to achieve Buddhahood, to, and which is achieved in dependence upon generating a sense of universal responsibility, born from universal love and compassion for all sentient beings. Because through that, one, one achieves the great collection of merit and virtue of Buddhahood by which one is able to actually communicate with sentient beings who are ready to listen throughout the universe in multiple emanations, which Buddhas do, and give them 
each individual what he or she needs to, to comprehend and is capable of putting into practice. Other, other information may come later, but Buddhists have this incredible capacity to always be there. But they can't, say, force feed Dharma into our minds. From our side, we have to be receptive. And a Buddhist mind knows what's happening in the minds of sentient beings throughout the universe. So this activity is the result of universal responsibility, bodhicitta, great compassion. And the capacity to know everything is the great collection of wisdom in a Buddhist mind, culminating in the omniscient mind of Buddhahood, of Dharmakaya. So, we all have the seed of Buddhahood. We can achieve, that is the ultimate potential of every sentient being's mind, to become a Buddha. So the supreme motivation is to achieve Buddhahood in that way, to help sentient beings in such a way. So now we come right back. Why aren't we doing it? It's because we are obscured by the belief that there's plenty of time. I can practice when, I've, when the kids have left school and, and I'm free and I've got my money situation sorted out. And uh, then, I, then I can really practice. We keep putting off the practice because we blind ourselves to the reality of impermanence, moment by moment change, subtle impermanence, and the gross impermanence of death, which can happen at any time. And this opportunity Having met the Dharma, the opportunity to put it into practice will be gone and we don't know when it will happen. I remember in the early days in the 1970s when uh, many young Western people were travelling to India, Nepal and meeting the Lamas, particularly my teachers, Lama Thupten Yeshi, Lama Thupten Zopa Rinpoche, who first, really were the first Lamas to give the, the Lama Room teachings to great audiences of people, not just Westerners. And there were several stories. One of a, an American woman who met the Lamas early on, maybe the 1971 or 72, went home and cleared up things and said she wanted to become a nun. So she f flying back to Nepal, the plane, there was a break in the flight in Bangkok. And so she stayed overnight or a couple of nights in a hotel in Bangkok and until her flight to Kathmandu was ready. And then I think after the second day, they found her body floating in the water Pattaya, I think Pattaya Beach near, near Bangkok. She had met that there was a uh, there was a man who used to prey on young travellers and drug them and steal their money and kill them. And somehow her karma had connected with this person in the hotel and that's what had happened to her. So she was all ready to become ordained and nun and practice, but death came first. There are lots of stories where, you know, young, apparently healthy people get some illness and infection, uh, s some severe illness, and as much as they want to, to practice, they can't. Their life is gone. So. These stories are just, we've all heard them, 
but we've got, but somehow we think, oh, that's really sad, but I'm okay. <laughs> it's not going to happen to me. I will be able to, to practice in the future. So, so we don't practice very hard. So that is the, the fundamental reason for this weekend teaching is for each of us not, not to become depressed but to become infused, activated by the reality of impermanence. There's one time I was in Australia and I was giving talks at our centre in Perth, in, in Western Australia, or in Bunbury, south of Perth. And I was ready to fly from Perth to Bombay to Bodhgaya, where Lama Tumzo Parimashe was giving initiations and teachings. And many students were going to Bodhgaya. So I think the night before I left, or the day before I left, I was staying at the house of the people who were looking after me. And we were out during the day and somebody broke in into that uh, house, in a, found a window and went in the window. And the only thing that was taken was my watch. <laughs> Not a particularly expensive watch, but my watch disappeared. But I, I, sh sugar, I think I bought a small travelling clock very similar to this one. And I went to India and I went to Bodhgaya at the Root Institute where Lama Zopa was there and many students. I didn't tell anybody about losing my watch. You know, I just forgot about it. Anyway, I was walking past Lama Zopa's room and the door was open. And he called me in. I hadn't met him yet, like that time. And so I, I went in, sort of, I'm not sure if I prostrated, put my hands together. And he held up three watches in his hand. And he said, Which one do you want? <laughs> I, I mean, how does he know? I thought. Anyway, one looked, I thought it was. Plastic. Sorry, I thought it was plastic and you know not very expensive and being very humble. I said, oh, that one. And he looked at it and he said, that's my favourite. <laughs> 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 and he, he gave it to me. And actually it wasn't plastic. Actually, the, the base of the watch was made from olive wood. And Remachet had bought it himself at a shop in Spain, you know, with many olive trees in Spain. Anyway, as Ribeche handed me the watch, and he, that the wooden, the face was wooden, like underneath the, the glass or the plastic. And he said to me, I've always wanted to, to paint on the surface of the watch, around the dial. Now is the time to die. So that whenever we look at our watch, now is the time to die. That is the, the way in which the guru teaches impermanence, to be mindful of impermanence. We're constantly checking the time. Why? Because we want to get to a movie, we want to go to a concert, we want to go to a party and have fun aren't we? Maybe not watches these days, it's usually those little screens that people carry. But that is such a profound lesson. We forget. Yeah, we might be ordained, we're a monk or a nun, we're a, a Buddhist practitioner, uh, and we, we, we've taken refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, and we attend teachings, and we retain, but still, we believe that peace and happiness are out there on the screen or friends, restaurants, food, you know, all the entertainments, nothing wrong with them, they're good, we, they, that's life. But that is forgetting. Now is the time to die. So this is important. 
it's even though this presentation of impermanence and death comes at the teachings of the, the being of initial scope, you know, the, uh, those aiming for a happy uh, rebirth and not rebirth in the hells. It doesn't mean it's only for those practitioners. You can't achieve nirvana if you're not constantly aware of impermanence and death. And there's no way we can achieve the bodhisattva's path. Bodhicitta, the ten grounds of the bodhisattva's path, Buddhahood, there is no way without acute awareness of impermanence and death. So this is not a beginner's subject. It's vital in the beginning, in the middle, and the end of one's spiritual development towards Buddhahood. So I've given you quite a, 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 a lot of notes um, gleaned from my, over the years I've gathered many teachings on the Lum Room and tried to put it together, and, uh, you know, the, the, according to the outline of Babalka Rinpoche's liberation in the palm of your hand. And so these are just essential points. Uh, to reflect upon in this subject. It begins with the, you know, the root problem, self-grasping ignorance, which we're born with. It is as a result of innate uh, imprints on our mind from past lives. Whenever we experience things in this life, things appear wrongly to our mind things appear to exist inherently. Now, inherent exist, there are two aspects to this wrong ap appearance. One aspect is that me, the self, and the selves of others, and other things, appear as unchanging. That there is the same me, same person, unchanging through time. I'm the same person I was yesterday, the day before, last week, last month, last year, and go right back, as long as we can remember, there is a sense of the same me. And when we think about the future, we, we think of our future self, the same me, tomorrow, next week, next month, and so on. There's this unchanging aspect. And the second aspect of the appearance of inherent existence is that this unchanging me is an entity who exists in my own right, independent, independent of change, independent of causes and conditions, independent of your know, labeling or imputation, a constant me existing in my own right. So that is the that's the meaning of the appearance of inherent ex appearance of inherent existence. And because we have that appearance, that appearance, our mind conceives or grasps at that appearance to be true. And it's just not only me, it's mum, dad, brother, sister, and so on, also appear as persons who are always the same person. Always the same mum, same dad, same friend, child, unchanging. And we have the conception of other individuals as existing inherently. And that's wrong. It's, it's, it's an illusion, it's totally false appearance. And even the material objects, the same object, unchanging. This is the fundamental problem that makes us complacent. We, we know that we should train our mind in Dharma, in the spiritual path, train our mind in renunciation, bodhicitta, wisdom realizing emptiness, but we're not really energized because we think, oh, no, it's the same me, same situation. I'm not going to die. 
it's naturally, yes, of course. We, every one of us knows we're going to die. Intellectually, we know that this body is going to age and become infirm, less capable of understanding and meditating and so on. But not yet. We, we, nah, I've got plenty of time. So, death is gross impermanence. And it is a reality. Subtle impermanence we're not aware of. Subtle impermanence is a moment by moment change. Very subtle. In physics, of course, we understand that the you know, particles of atoms and molecules and so on are changing moment by moment. Therefore, the entire body composed of simply atoms and molecules is changing moment by moment. It's never the same for more than a, a split second. But that, the, like the aging process, we know it but we don't really, not too concerned about it. And death, even less concerned. So, when we look at our watch, now is the time to die. As in the notes, it's like a hammer smashing that complacency. It crushes attachment, it crushes hatred, jealousy, pride. That's when we should remember. We see an attractive situation, food, another person, a concert, whatever. Oh, that would be so good. Yes, I... Oh, I, and we rush through our meditation practice in the morning so we get out and go there. That's when we should remember subtle impermanence and gross impermanence of death. What happens if I die on my way to the restaurant? People do die on their way to restaurants. We read all the time. Young couples who have just been married they're killed in a car crash on the day of their marriage, believing they've got a whole life together. Children, happiness, mutual growth, but gone. So, this awareness doesn't mean that we smash our, our cells, we smash our happiness. It doesn't mean that we don't go to restaurants, we don't get married, we don't enjoy music. The purpose of being consciously aware of death is to not be attached, to not regard this food, this pleasure, whatever it is, as being of supreme importance. It is of secondary importance. Fundamentally, we're human beings. And anyway, we can't really study and meditate and reflect upon the Dharma if our mind is unhappy. So there are advantages to, pee, to happiness in that it makes the mind calm, it, may, it energizes the mind and gives us the opportunity to really put time into listening, thinking and meditating. So, instead of being, how do you say, uh, suppressing our human existence, you know, this constant awareness of death, now is the time to die, it gives us the opportunity to do things really constructively in a very positive way. There was one time I was uh, in France, I was the director of Nalanda Monastery in France, Nama Tutanyeshi. He asked me to go there in 1981 to start a monastery uh, for, the, for the Sangha 
of F P of T Sangha. And uh, at this very beautiful three story, very old building had been bought for that purpose near Vajigini Institute in the south of France. So I went there not knowing much. Luckily I'd studied a little bit of French at school, so my very poor French was enough to sort of communicate. And things fell up. Anyway, I won't go to the history of the Land of Monastery, even though for me it was totally enjoyable. But after a couple of years, Lama Yeshi came to visit. And in the local town called Lavore, which is near Toulouse, but more of a, a rural farming community, there was the village fete, where the traveling carnival comes to town. There are all sorts of entertainments, like the, the center strip of the robe, which was all trees and gardens and shops. On each side, so it was very big. Uh, there was this, the, the village fete was happening. In France, this is a real tradition, and sideshows and games and so on. So Lama Yeshi was there and the fete was happening. And one, I think Geshe Jampa Techchok, who was our abbot, and he was later to become the abbot of Sarah J Monastery. He invited Lama Yeshi to go to the fete one evening. Lama was very tired. This was only a year before he, he died from heart failure. You know, he had this heart condition resulting from rheumatic fever. And he was very tired. I could see. I guess you take shock. Said, well, let's go to the fete. So Lama was reluctant. Then he said, yes, we go to the fete. So, you know, most people went to the village fete for entertainment. So I went, it was just the three of us, myself, Lama Yeshi, and Geshe Techo. And I drove them into the town and we started down the line of entertainments. And the first sights show, stall, was, uh, oh, there are lots of prizes, these prizes, and there are machines with like tractors going back and forth, pushing coins down, a, or tokens, down a slot. And if you could make the machine push down a, a number of tokens, you win a prize. So both Geshe Tenshu and Lama Eshi started playing these machines. And like, they were into it with so much energy, so much, any, no kid could have put so much energy and enthusiasm into it. A little bit cheating, like shaking the table, and, and even getting the assistants to push coins down, which weren't very... Really. And it was such a production. And I looked around, there was this big semicircle of people just watching us and being entertained, laughing. We didn't speak any French, but just they were into it 200%. The prizes meant nothing. They were entertaining the other people. They were entertaining the people who were even pushing more coins down than should have gone and giving us prizes which we didn't really deserve. Then we went to the next one, which was lucky envelopes. You know, you buy, you pay money, you get this little envelope, you open up, you might get a prize or something. And I remember Lama Yeshi put on such an entertaining act of buying these envelopes and looking at them. And so there was a big counter where the man behind was selling his the lucky envelopes and his daughter, maybe two or two and a half years old, was sitting up on top of the counter and she was eating an ice cream. And she, like Lama Yeshi was there, and she was just like, <laughs> just looking at Lama Yeshi. And the ice cream was melting, <laughs> flowing down. <laughs> but she was totally entranced by the antics of, of Lama Yeshi. 
of buying the lucky. And again, we had the, the people, it's the French people starting to follow us now. We were the entertainment, not the sideshows. And then went on for a few more. And then suddenly, Lama Yeshi said, now we go back. Stop, serious, stop all that. Back to the monastery. And I realised that Lama did that for me. Because I had encouraged Geshe Techok's suggestion that we take Lama to the sideshow. And, you know, what's the point? So, again, it was a teaching on, okay, you don't run away from pleasure and happiness. You use it to help others, to put smiles on others' faces. In the very early days, you know, when Lama Yeshe had at the Lama Room courses at Copan, 250 people, mostly young Westerners, but from other countries as well. They called us hippies, but we were just young people <laughs> looking, looking for truth and reality and, and entertainment. And Lama Yeshe, you know, he was giving a teaching, he was saying, look, don't, See, renunciation, it was something, I, I can't remember exactly, but he said, when you go to a party, or you're invited to a party, then most people put on, you know, the girls put on makeup and wear the nicest clothes, etc., in order to be admired, for, you know, for their benefit, that people would be attracted, to like them. He said, that's not right. It doesn't mean don't go to parties. If you want to go to a party, you dress up beautifully. You wear really good clothes. You put on makeup. You look attractive because an attractive person makes other people happy. It gives invigoration. It, 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 it enhances their mind. So if that is your motivation, then that is a Dharma motivation to go to the party, to have fun, listen to music, dance, so on. Anyway, so I'm sort of saying this, so don't, oh, a weekend on death and impermanence, how depressing. I'd rather go somewhere else. Okay, now, in the, there are four misperceptions that all of us have which, co which cause error in our making the best use of this life, which harm our Dharma practice and which cause unnecessary misery. So these four misperceptions are listed. The first is to see changing things, ourselves and others, as unchanging, right? So with subtle impermanence. So, this is the first misperception. In regard to our own self, our friends, our parents, even our enemies, by seeing them as the same person who pleased me or who displeased me, and therefore was a friend or an enemy in the past, today, this is the same person. And so, now, because they pleased me in the past, I'm attached. I like them. They offer me benefit. They said something hurtful to me or about me in the past. They're awful. They're the same person who did that. But it's not true. It's not true. The person who pleased us can have completely changed and may not like us anymore. And that can be devastating to our attachment. The person who harmed us, they change. They can be liking us. They can have compassion, kindness towards us. But we don't see that. We cannot see that because we've locked them into this permanent, unchanging, bad, sorry, bad category. And the other, good category. And me, the same category, me. So you see, by our subjectively 
locking others into a fixed category, we give them no space to change. And we give ourselves no ability to recognize change. And things are always changing. So we always have to be aware of everything newly presenting to us is something new. It's like, you know, in our discrimination, then other people's, their race, or their, their language, or the clothes they wear, or the politics that they uh, follow, we instantly judge them according to our preconceptions. Those preconceptions are so often wrong. The Dalai Lama, he, he said on many occasions that as he travels around the world and he meets so many different people, he treats everybody, not only those to whom he's introduced, but strangers in the street, as long lost friends. Like, you know, we, if, when we meet somebody a good friend we haven't seen for a long time, we suddenly meet them. We're so interested in them. How's life been? And we're happy when we hear the good things. We're compassionate when we hear the bad things. There's this real outgoing interest, sincere interest in our friends' lives. So the Dalai Lama sees everybody in this manner. No, how do you say, no projections, no preconceptions, no self-centeredness, self-importance, I'm, I'm the Dalai Lama, I'm so important. None of that. Just genuine, heart-to-heart, -heart, sincere interest in the welfare of others. We can do that. The Dalai Lama doesn't say, I do this because I'm a bodhisattva. I'm, he's, he's, he doesn't have to tell us. I mean, we see that it, that is true, how he does relate to others. But that is a teaching. If we really aspire to be bodhisattvas, to follow the bodhisattva's path, now is the time. It's not going on a retreat or attending teachings, you know, going to India. It is what the way we relate to people out in the street, to people at the breakfast table, our own family, in genuine, sincere interest in their welfare. And it's not only subjectively from our side, but from the side of others. They know it. We know when somebody is sincerely interested in our happiness, or they're just saying, hello, how are you today? Yeah. When they don't care how we are today, <laughs> they're not really interested. It's just a common greeting. How are you? I'm all right. I mean, I often think that often, you know, we, we spontaneously say, I'm okay, thank you. Sometimes we can ask somebody, are you really okay? And they can burst into tears because they're not really okay. It's just a superficial response. But when we say, are you really okay, that indicates a genuine concern for the welfare of others. And we masquerade, you know, we, we tend to cover up our unhappiness. I'm okay. But that cover can quickly come off. And so, this first misconception of seeing people as unchanging is a mistake from our side. These four misconceptions are opposed by the four seals, you know, the four stamps 
with this is Buddhism. And the, so the first seal of Buddha's teachings is that whatever arises from causes and conditions is in the nature of change, is impermanent. It completely, it changes moment by moment and will ultimately cease altogether. So we apply this to our possessions. Our possessions wear out, are clinging. Oh no, that, that's a family heirloom. That's been in the family for generations. My great, great grandmother used to have that jewelry or whatever. It's changed. It can't last forever. It's going to change. Some of us, you, you know, we think we, we know scientifically that one day this earth is going to be consumed by the sun, you know, supernova. So all of the visible uh, effects of human endeavor, human society, all of the great art treasures which actually can no longer be kept in museums because they're deteriorating, so they're all locked up in special vaults with humidity control and, and insect control. So you don't see the originals, you only see copies in the museum. But still in that secure vault, they're deteriorating, you can't stop it. And the world, everything is going to disappear, and that can make us feel a little bit sad it shouldn't. It's, it's, and, it, and it's happened. Look at Australia. People's lives, so many. Their houses that they lived in, their parents lived in, their life, everything's being burnt in fire. So many thousands of houses and families. Everything is totally consumed in one, one night. Nothing can last forever. Yes, it's sad. Yes, we should try to prevent it. But inevitably, change will happen. So, in our mind, in our heart, by being aware of this, then the loss of family heirlooms and so on, it, let it go. We can't reverse. We can't bring these things back. But being depressed and broken up is not the right response. That, that is the response of the false belief in permanence, in unchanging. So that's the gross examples of impermanence. How our mind can react to things in a different way if it's changed. The second misconception we have is regarding that which is in the nature of suffering as real pleasure. So, what we regard as pleasure in this life, all happiness that depends upon changing circumstances is actually a type of suffering. Because whatever pleasure we have from food or music or whatever, inevitably stops when the object is finished or if we have too much of the object, too much food, even listen to too much music, we become sick of it. It makes us sick. Or we become choosy, dissatisfied. Or I want something better, something different. And so constantly running, running after the perfect sensory experience. This happens, this is the nature of pleasure in a confused mind, that it's actually a type of suffering. And when it's stopped, we're miserable. We want it to happen again. But there's no guarantee we can create the same conditions. So the second seal of Buddha's teachings is that all contaminated 
phenomena are in the nature of suffering. Contaminated means whatever arises as a result of karma and disturbing emotions is in the nature of misery. So whatever pleasant objects we experience in our life a result of karma, virtuous karma, but contaminated virtue. Virtue contaminated by the belief in inherent existence. We've already talked about the problems with inherent existence. And uh, the affliction is attachment that we, we cannot experience pleasure in our ordinary minds without being attached to the object of pleasure. Attachment exaggerates the object and sees it as more than it actually is. And attachment is actually a troubling state of mind. We're experiencing the pleasure but we don't want it to stop. And we get jealous as soon as somebody else gets something better or competitive towards somebody who wants to take the object of pleasure. So we we can't experience, if we really check up, happiness separated from eventual disappointment, from the letdown. So, but no, we don't, this mistaken view is to see that happiness as real happiness, something to strive for. We forget the letdown. People who are addicted to alcohol or drugs they, they know that alcohol is going to damage the body, can kill the body. Drugs damage the body, can kill the body. But they, the mind still grasps at the high, the intoxication, the pleasure. Even aware that this is inevitably followed by a severe letdown. So we see the pleasure as supreme to be aimed for. We check up, even our craving for our favorite food is a type of drug addiction. <laughs> our craving to be with the company of our favorite friends who entertain us is a type of addiction. Our friends, because everything is subject to change, so friends can't always be entertaining. Their life can be sad and so they can't entertain us. Or they may not like us anymore. They don't want to entertain us anymore. In fact, they say hurtful things. This is seeing suffering as pleasure. The third problem is that we see Im the imperfect as perfect or the impure as pure. So fundamentally we all want real peace, real happiness and we project on objects as being really pleasurable from their side, like pure. And we all dream of, the, yeah, one day I'm going to live in a peaceful place, the weather will be perfect, the friends will be perfect, everything. We have this craving to establish perfect peace in our everyday lives. The good job, the good husband, the good wife, the good children. Then I'll be happy. It doesn't happen. The third seal of Buddha's teachings is that only nirvana, liberation from karma and disturbing emotions is peace. That is true peace. Because of the attainment of nirvana, the causes, or nirvana is attained with the destruction of the causes of unhappiness. It is the experience of the cessation of problems. That is nirvana. And finally, the fourth misconception is, we've already talked about it, which is that which is not inherently existing 
as inherent existing. Myself and all objects in my life, which are in reality empty of inherent existence, we see them as absolutely true as inherently existing. So the fourth seal of Buddha's teachings is all phenomena are selfless. What selfless means doesn't mean that they're nothing. It means that they're empty of an inherently existing identity or self. So those four seals of Buddha's teachings, this is what identifies Buddhist teaching. It's, it's the definition of Buddhist teachings, these four seals, and they oppose those four misconceptions, which we subjectively destroy any chance of happiness and create so much unhappiness. All right. So that's the introduction. Uh, this afternoon, well, we'll follow the, the outline of the notes, the, uh, a lot of which we've, has already come up, the disadvantages of not remembering impermanence, and the advantages of remembering impermanence and death, the eight worldly concerns, and then the the death process itself, we will get into that probably this afternoon. Well, not actually, but just descriptively, okay. Well, you can't be sure. So watch out as you cross the road to the restaurants on the other side. All right, so thanks for listening and we'll see you after lunch. I dedicate the positive energy of this morning's discussion to our tablet of enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Thank you.